Good morning. As we've been studying through a series of lessons from time to time, we've been studying through like the fundamentals of the church called Church 101 because we as a church need to remember and rediscover those fundamentals that make up what we need to have in the Lord's church for those who are maybe new converts or growing in the faith. And of course, there are lessons like Proverbs we've been studying where we can all, of course, gather some great wisdom and insight into how to apply that to our everyday lives. And we also have series on the Holy Spirit because, uh, you know, there are some the more difficult topics that we need to cover as we grow into older Christians. And especially the book of Revelation is another topic, another series of, uh, that we could study that is very difficult, but yet we need to study it because we do not want to be led away by false teachers or by error. We want to stand on the truth. And there are so many who take the book of Revelation out of context. And that's why it's very important that we recognize what is this book trying to say to us, say to us today. What do we know about Jesus? What do you study about Jesus when you read through the book of Revelation? What do we study about God's kingdom? What do we study about... What do we know about all the other things that we could talk about? There's so many things to understand. And, of course, we've been going through the great splendid introduction of Revelation not too long ago and trying to understand what this book is saying. And, of course, we want to read Revelation 1, 4 through 6 to help us to understand more to the introduction of this book. So let's read it. The first, we're going to look at six main points, and this is one of the first main points that we'll look at. John to the seven churches which are in Asia. So if we want to make our first point, if we want to look at the seven churches of Asia Minor, we're not going to look, we're just going to look at them very briefly. But I want you to recognize where these churches were that John was writing to. Uh, John, of course, is the inspired writer, and we see how he was writing this to those churches in Asia. Now he's not talking about the continent we know as Asia. He's talking about a province of the Roman Empire known as Asia Minor. And uh, as you can see, we have studied uh, the book of uh, uh, F at the church at Ephesus not too long ago. And that's where John obviously was there for a long time, but then he was sent to the Isle of Patmos. And pa Patmos is a little island right to the left of Asia Minor. So it's very... Uh, easy to understand why he'd be writing to these seven churches. Well, why is it that, why, what's so significant about, about that word se seven? Why is that number so important? You know, we find uh, seven days in a week. What else do you find that's important about the word seven? So many things in the Bible that appeal to that number. And of course, this number seven is found 54 times. And all it means is complete or perfect. And uh, what's really interesting to me is that since it was written to seven churches, that obviously means it stands for all the congregations. Revelation was meant for at all times, for all congregations. Because when we study Revelation 2 and 3, well, there are so many great lessons we can get, gain from that, such as Ephesus, that that church had left its first love. Are we at Deborah, are we leaving our first love? And, of course, we could appeal to all the churches that are found there and the struggles that they were struggling with and apply the, the lessons there that we need today. But as we know, what they did was they would, uh, of course, John was writing on a, on a scroll. And, of course, when he gave it to, uh, like Colossians 4, verse 16, Paul would send the epistle of Colossians to Laodicea. And he said to read the epistle from Laodicea. So obviously these congregations were sending this epistle to that church and then that epistle will copy it, make it some more copies and send it to other congregations. And it was just circulating widely. And that was the purpose, was to get the word of God out to the people of God. So we read about the seven churches of Asia Minor. Now we want to look at the spiritual blessings. Notice, notice next what John says. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. If you look uh, at the spiritual blessings, we notice two of them that John addresses and that Paul also uses in his epistles. First of all, he talks about grace. Grace. 
and peace. Now, what is the grace of God? What is grace? It is the unmerited favor of God. None of us deserve God's grace. God, out of his own nature, has, has within himself decided that he wants to offer us the gift of grace. And the greatest gift, the indescribable gift that he did get, give was Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so we see that we have access to this grace. We can have peace with God. And peace is basically means that we can be made whole. It's not, it's not just talking about absence of war, but actually feeling, knowing within yourself that there is, you're at rest, you're at calm, you're in tra tranquility, that you have been reconciled to God and that you are no longer separated by your sins. And so that's why in Romans 5 verse 1, Paul can say, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. You know, there are some who teach the doctrine that we're saved by faith alone. Some will even teach that we're saved by grace alone. But this, as you can read from these verses, that's just false as it can be. We have to have faith in Jesus. We have to comply ourselves with the terms, the conditions of salvation in order to have access to the grace of God. And so that's very important for us to understand about grace and peace. Notice Titus 2, verse 4. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So how are we justified by grace? Well, Paul explains the washing of regeneration, even the renewing of the Holy Spirit. And we'll talk about what that is an allusion to as this lesson goes on. So the question I have is, do we desire grace? Do we desire peace in our lives? We can have that if we are willing to be put God first, if we're willing to obey what he has said, put the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ because all spiritual blessings are found in who? In Ephesians 1 verse 3 says they're found in Christ Jesus. So if I want spiritual blessings, I have to be found in Christ Jesus. That's so very important for us to understand. And obviously these Christians in Asia Minor, they had grace and peace. Do you? Do you have grace and peace? Do you recognize that there's sin in your life and that you recognize that you are in need of the grace of God? Well, if you will access that gift of grace by faith, then you can have peace with God. So, we see that we've talked about, so far, the seven churches of Asia Minor. We've talked about those spiritual blessings that are found in Jesus Christ. Now, let's talk about the seven spirits. And so it says, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. Well, Paul, what is the seven spirits before his throne, you might be thinking. Remember, as we have talked about with the seven, word seven, the number seven, what did it mean? Complete, perfect. So, obviously, what is this for reference to? What does this mean? Well, I just think all John is trying to say is the Holy Spirit. Is not the Holy Spirit complete? Is he not perfect? He is indeed divine. He shares the divine nature. He is deity. And so that's why we understand in Revelation 3, verse 1, is where it's also found. Notice this. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things says he who has the seven spirits of God. 
and the seven stars. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. So obviously, we see one who has the seven spirits, and also found in Revelation 4, verse 5. And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Obviously, we see that associated with deity, so this no doubt is a reference to the Holy Spirit. And so that's what we understand him to be talking about. Revelation 5, verse 6. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Luke 4, verse 18. Why is it, it, say, it said, you know, just a little bit earlier that the one who has the seven spirits of God, and obviously that was referencing to Jesus. Well, did Jesus, was he not anointed by the Holy Spirit, as we talked about in our previous lesson? Certainly. Yes, he was. Acts 10, 38 points that out. And so that's why in Luke 4, verse 18, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. And so we can very well understand what Jesus is talking about here uh, in, in this book of Revelation. And that, that's a reference to the Holy Spirit who gave us this book, who gave us the book of Revelation as well, that we may all try to seek to understand it. And those who seek to understand are indeed blessed. Well, what about Revelation uh, 1 verse, uh, verse 4? It says... And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth. So let us talk about the Son of God in this passage. Notice very carefully there are three descriptions that are given of Jesus. First of all, he's a faithful witness. Secondly, he's the firstborn of the dead. And thirdly, he is the ruler over the kings of the earth. Or that might be possibly translated land. But we'll see what the context has to say about that in just a moment. The faithful witness. What does it mean for Jesus to be a faithful witness? Well, obviously, when Jesus was here on the earth, who did he gain? Who did he, what did he try to do? Well, he tried to teach the people, did he not? And whose words did he try to teach? He always taught the words that the Father wanted him to teach. And he was always trustworthy because he always spoke the truth. In John 8, 31, 32. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. He would say to Pilate, in John 18, he would say, Everyone who hears my voice is of the truth. Everyone who, try, who obeys what I say, they're going to be of the truth. They're going to know that I speak the truth because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So we know that he portrayed and what he taught was what the Father would teach. In fact, in John 8, verse 14, he says this, Jesus answered and said to them, Even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true. For I know where I came from and where I am going. But you do not know where I come from and where I am going. You judge according to the flesh, I judge no one. And yet if I do judge, my judgment is true. For I am not alone. But I am with the Father who sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one who bears witness of myself and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. So you can very well understand that Jesus brought forth the truth that he is the Savior of the world, that he came to die on the cross to save us from our sins, and that if we will comply with the conditions of salvation, we too can be saved from our sins. Notice the next description of Jesus is that he's the firstborn from the dead. What does Jesus mean by that phrase? Does he mean that he was the first to rise from the dead? Well, obviously... Uh, we'll talk about that in just a moment. We know that he does mean that he is pre preeminent. Now, we find that in Colossians chapter 1. If you look very closely, 
I love studying the book of Ephesians because G, uh, Paul is talking about the prominence, the, the preeminence of the G, of Jesus Christ's church. And then, of course, in the book of Colossians, he's talking about the preeminence of Jesus Christ, how Jesus is far above all rulers and principalities and powers. And so he was the first and foremost to be raised from the dead and to die no more. Because we know that there are those who were raised from the dead, but they died. Such as we know Lazarus that Jesus raised, the widow uh, of Nain's son. He rose from the dead, but obviously he, he had to die sometime after that. And there are also examples in the Old Testament. And so we realize that Jesus was to rise and to die no more. Death could not hold him. And so that's why he has the keys of Hades. And that's why he is able to open and to close. He is able to now, one day and the final day, he will resurrect everyone from the dead. So we think about why he is the firstborn from the dead. Thirdly, he is the ruler of all the kings of the earth, or sometimes it might be translated land, but let's talk about this just for a moment. And uh, if you want to look in Daniel 7, verse 13 and 14, this is obviously what John is alluding to because he uses the words uh, son, of, son of God, and also, of course, in Daniel 7, it's son of man. And I want you to look very carefully because what Jesus' role is, is that he is indeed the ruler of all of over the entire universe, over the entire world. He rules in all the kingdoms of men. And, of course, it says in Daniel 7, 13, 14, that God, the ancient of days, came and give him, gave him a kingdom, which is to reign over all men. And so Daniel 7, verse 13 and 14, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven, he came to the ancient of days, and they brought him near before him. And then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. So what territory does our Lord reign over? Over it all. Every single acre. 1 Timothy 6, verse 15 and 16, the Bible says, which he will manifest in his own time. He who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen nor can see, to whom be glory, honor, and everlasting power. Amen. But it could be possible, like I said, even though we know in the context that it could be relating to the kings over all the earth, it could be relating to this to kings in Palestine. And let me explain. Because when you look in the context very carefully, like, like let's say Acts 4, verse 24 through 26, and Revelation 1, verse 7, notice very carefully what it says here. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the mouth of your servant David has said, Why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. And the question I have is, who crucified Jesus? Who was the one who were shouting out, crucify him, crucify him? We know it was you know, the Romans who, who uh, did the crucifixion. But you remember that Pontius Pilate did not want to crucify Jesus. He wanted to let him go free. But of course he gave him to the peer pressure of the crowd, which we know to be the Jews. They were the ones that wanted to crucify him. And that's why it says... Uh, the kings of the earth took their stand. The rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. Could it not be that those of the Sanhedrin, since they were the ruling class of the Jews, that's who that Jesus is talking about, uh, what John is talking about, the kings of the land of Palestine? It could be possible, but it could mean over all the earth. And it probably most likely means the king over all the earth. But we can look at Revelation 1, verse 7, it says, which we'll study hopefully in a couple of weeks. Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth, or possibly translated land, will mourn because of him, even so. Amen. Well, there's some great lessons that I want you to think about. 
when you think about these descriptions of Jesus, do you trust Jesus to be a faithful witness? Do you believe that he has spoken the truth? You know, we see how in history that Jesus performed miracles. Rabbi, we know you can't do these miracles, Nicodemus said, unless God is with him. And of course, we see the evidence of the disciples, how they mourned that Jesus had died, but all of a sudden they had a changed attitude. And they were proclaiming that Jesus had risen from the dead. Something changed in them. And they never did take back that Jesus had not risen from the dead, but that he did. And so something marvelous obviously occurred that brought these men to say, I will even die for this belief. And that he did indeed raise from the dead, that he is the firstborn from the dead. Do you believe Jesus rose from the dead? It's something that you need to really consider because that's part of the gospel message that we are to believe that Jesus died and that he rose again. But, most of all, do I believe that he is King of kings and Lord of lords? Yes, we may say mentally, you know, just say, yeah, he's King of kings and Lord of lords, but is he king over your life? Is he king over my life? Is he really, really uh, letting our li- are we letting our lives be controlled by him in our finances, in our families? Are we really given the time to study with our children the Word of God and so on and so forth? Are we really putting first God and His kingdom? Are we attending faithfully as we ought to? As the Lord would say that we are to attend on the first day of the week, Hebrews 10, verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as many or some is. But it's not just being here on the first day of the week. It's also doing good works because God prepared us to be a good workmanship that we ought to do good works and that we ought to be servants who are serving one another and serving the community and trying to bring people to Christ. And so, really, is he reigning as king over your life? Fifthly, we want to look at the salvation plan of God. Notice very carefully what John writes next. To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. What is John referencing? He's referencing the same thing that Paul was referencing that I told you that I would uh, that uh, he was allu- refer- alluding to. Remember the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit? What is Paul talking about? Paul and John are talking about the same thing. They're talking about being immersed in water. But notice very carefully what Jesus what, what John says to him who loved us. And of course, Jesus would die for all of his enemies. He died for everyone. And he seeks that all come to the knowledge of the truth because he desires to save all men. But of course, all men will not accept what he has said. Not all men will obey what Jesus has said. But we know that Jesus loves us. He died for his worst enemies, Romans 5, verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. But notice very carefully, and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And we asked ourselves, well, what's the meaning of that? Well, look very carefully at Jesus. He died on the cross, and why did he die? To shed his blood. Now, what is the cleansing agent of our sins? It's the blood of Jesus Christ. But the question I have to ask you very carefully is you need to answer How do you come into contact with the blood of Jesus? And, of course, when you think about it, I just want to ask a question. Two questions. If baptism is not very important, you know, if I just, uh, if I, as some teach in faith only, all they say is, well, all you got to do is just believe Jesus Christ and you're saved right there at the spot, and then maybe a few days later you can be baptized to show that you have been saved. Well, if that's true, if baptism is not a condition of salvation, why did Peter bother to mention it? Why did he, since he was answering the question of what to do to be saved, men and brethren, what shall we do? In Acts 2, verse 37. And he said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. If If salvation comes before baptism, why does Peter say it is for the remission of sins that it will it's going to go toward that why and matthew 26 verse 28 i want you to notice these two phrases that are found in acts 2 38 matthew 26 28 when jesus was instituting the lord's supper both 
have in them, in them for the remission of sins. Do you notice that? And it's the same Greek and the same in the original language of the Greek. Now here's my question: Did Jesus die so that men could be were already saved? Is that the reason why he died? No, he died so that men could be saved. And so he died so that people could have the remission of their sins. Well, repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. It's very easy to understand that when I comply with believing in Jesus Christ, repenting of my sins, that I'm going to turn away from all sinful relationships, that I'm going to turn away from my past sins, and that I'm immersed in water, that's when I come into contact with the blood of Christ. It's that understandable. And why is it the case that so many take it out of context? Notice very carefully Romans 6, 3 and 4. Or do you not know that as many of us as we're baptized into Christ Jesus, we're baptized into his death? What did he shed at his death? His blood. Therefore we are buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ is raised for the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. Acts 22, 16, Now while you're waiting, arise and be baptized, washing away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So when I am baptized into Christ Jesus, when I am washed in His own blood, what does that make me? Well, there's a special status for God's people. And let's read carefully what John says about us. He has made us kings and priests to His God and Father to Him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. I, I really like the, uh, I think American Standard does a better translation. Instead of king kings, it says to be a kingdom. Do you remember the phrase kingdom of priest? You certainly do, because as we have studied once before, we've studied in times past, so Adam had dominion over the whole earth. He was a king. But he was also obviously a priest in the first temple because that Garden of Eden served as a temple and that he was to keep it and to tend to it. And that's why it says, let them have dominion. But what, did, what happened to Adam? He failed to obey God's commission. He was driven out of the Garden of Eden. And so that's why there was a corporate Adam, so to speak, that there was a old Israel, as we called them, they were to be a kingdom, a priest. They were to build this tabernacle. They were going to dwell in this land of Canaan that just was like the Garden of Eden. But what happened to old Israel? They failed to obey God's commission, and they were driven out of the land of Canaan. They were went into captivity. And that's why they were to be a kingdom of priests, God says, and a holy nation. But as you can see, they failed and that's why we, why we see that there is the last Adam to come, Jesus Christ. And how he was both king and priest because when he sat down at the right hand of God, he showed forth his blood that he had shed and that he was a true priest who was offering a sacrifice because he himself was the sacrifice for our sins and that he reigns over the whole earth and that Jesus can make you and I to be a kingdom of priests if we uh, obey the gospel of Christ. 1 Peter 2 verse 5 says, You also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house. Uh, we, can, we can just say a spiritual temple because that is the house of God. A holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And so the question I have for us is, are we in that kingdom of priests? Are we allowing God to reign in our lives? You know, we can either submit to God now and let Him reign in our lives, but if we submit later when He comes, you know, it will be too late. It will be too late for us to submit because He will come and judge every man according to His works. And it will be too late for us to obey the plan of salvation because we have waited just, and so we need to be prepared now. We need to ask ourselves, am I ready? Are you ready to meet God on the day of judgment? 
Maybe it's the case that you have thought about becoming a Christian. We want to urge you to do so. We want you to obey Jesus Christ. To put, on, put Him on in baptism. Or maybe it's the case you're a child of God and you realize you have not been the priest. That you have not been what you ought to be. That you have failed like Adam. You have failed like the old Israel. You have not been given God the glory. Why not start, once again, giving God the glory in your life? While together we stand and sing the invitation song.